hello everyone and thanks Javier for your introduction. Uh, so yeah, the talk topic is how to build a Python community. Uh, and well, yeah, so let's get started with the annoying parts. Like that's me, that's my Twitter handle. Uh, the picture is actually from PyCon Finland 2012. Uh, I think, yeah, I think it's a PyCon Finland 2012. Uh, and you can reach me in that email address and so forth. Uh, so the talk topic is how to build a local Python community. So what we're going to go through in this talk is that, well, first of all, like, first thing is why build a local Python community? Uh, how do you manage like expectations? If you build something from scratch, like how do you deem if it's successful or not? Uh, what resources do you need? And if I have time, I try to leave some time for the question in the end. If I have time, I'm going to go quickly through like how do you grow up your community once you establish something. But first, the internet is an amazing place. Not for the old parts of it, but some parts. Like there are really good guys on online. There's the pip install pi ladies. There's the Django girls uh, organizing document. Uh, there's also uh, conference organizer handbook by PPK, and then there's the from Python in Punk conference by I think it's written by Jesse Noller, right? I might be wrong, but anyway, the slides will contain links to all of these. The latter two are about conferences, but they still like skimming through them while they talk about like hundreds of people in a two-day conference with one track. Uh, they still give you some ideas of what what like a running a community. Or like local community means. The two first are really amazing when you're just starting from scratch. Like even if you won't be doing a PyLadies or Django Ghost community, just read them through because they give you billion, billion tips. And then the last point, like there's plenty of people like me, all the people in this conference or people in other conference or uh, meetup groups that uh, are willing to help you if you just ask them tips uh, what to do with your newly built uh, meetup groups. All right, so let's talk about, talk about the why part. Uh, the why part I found really interesting because I think it's a really hard question. Like, I can't tell you why you should, do, uh, why you should build your own local Python community. I sort of hope that it, because the people who are here, either you just happen to stay here after the previous talk or you actually are really interested in building your local Python community. Uh, maybe, like, maybe you as People want to do it because you think EuroPython is a really cool conference. So you just spent a week here. You, maybe it was your first time you feel like, oh, damn, this was really nice. And you want to replicate that one. Not necessarily as a conference, but you want to get like same kind of people together. Maybe you want to meet people who are interested in Python. I remember when we were starting uh, PyCon Finland in 2010, uh, back in then with my co-founder co in a company I was working on, uh, he, he just said, like, he has no idea who works in Python in Finland. Like, zero idea. We were two guys. We knew a few others there and there, but we had no idea. So we decided, like, let's build a conference. And we found, like, 30 other. And next year, it was 150 other. And now we know about 200 other Python developers in Finland. Or maybe you want to create, like, a sub-community. Maybe where you are, there's already a really nice Python community or other communities but you want to focus on something. You want to build your PyDadies, you want to build your own Django girls, or you want to have a local Twisted user group. Of course, it's going to be you and Hinek, and that's it. Uh, or something like that. Like, there's plenty of reasons. Just what I'm trying to say, like, try to have a reason, because that helps to you to motivate. Like, if you have a some even a wakey idea, that motivates you a lot. So then why do I do this? Like, why? why have I been involved in PyCon Finland, PyCon Sweden, the Stockholm Python user group, and so forth? I think that there's a lot of good in the community, especially in the Python community, there's, but still there's a lot of bad in it. It's a kind of a, tech, a, kind of, it's a technocracy where people are merited in weird ways to give them leadership positions, and I think like actually to make it more diverse, actually make it more a, a community that accepts more people, and uh, so that. Uh, and that you can actually like change the community. I think, or I feel that I need to get my hands dirty. I want to be part of building that community. And the easiest way to do that for me, it seems to be that I start organizing this stuff. And then when I'm organizing that, when I'm part of the people organizing those, I just keep tracks on like all kinds of potential stuff around diversity and try to emphasize as much as I can. 
But no matter what reason you have, I strongly suggest you to go for it. Like if you just have some motivation to do, do this stuff, if you really want to have a local, local community running, like go for it. All right. So you came up with a nice reason. You felt like you want to replicate the awesomeness of EuroPython in your uh, local area. So how do you manage expectations? How do you deem that something was successful? Like you want to announce your first meetup, uh, your first like a g gathering of the local Python people. Do you like count the number of people that showed up? Do you count the number of speakers you, that showed up? Do you hand out feedback forms and like ask them was, were the pinches good or bad? Uh, and then judge from that. I think screw all those. Uh, back in 2009 or something, I was a part of organizing an, an agile conference. And we had an amazing metric for the first conference. There's someone else. Like, if you're the organizer, there's another person. It doesn't matter if you're, it's your friend or your parent. Like, if there's someone else, like, if someone actually is willing to spend their free time to come into your event, uh, doesn't take part in the organizing part, then deem it a successful event. If it's someone else that you don't even know, then, like, then you've blown all the expectations to the roof already. So don't overcommit. Don't like, expect that your first meetup is going to be a billion people. It might be you and two others, or you and five others, and you and one other, but you might still have an amazing talks. Don't also overcommit by like, taking a too big of a, a slice of the pie at the beginning. Uh, we sort of did that with PyCon Finland, uh, that the first Python-related event in Finland was a whole conference. We had no idea what we were doing. Uh, I think like 100 people signed up. We forgot to send them invoices, so they didn't pay, uh, pay, pay at all. Like 30 of them actually showed up in the conference, and our company back in the days ended up paying the whole thingy, and we never invoiced anyone. So like, if you start too big, you might get kind of turned down. It was still an awesome conference, but it was a lot of work, and we clearly started from too big. If you think about the PyCon Sweden, Instead, the, its origins are in the Django Stockholm user group that then became more generic like a Stockholm Python user group, and then it grew up to a conference. That way, it was way easier to like, build from a small and then like, keep on expanding when you felt like, hey, we want to do something bigger. All right, so you set up doing stuff, and then you're going to think about like, like, how much do you need people? What kind of resources do you need to run the stuff? Uh, First, we can start talking about the most important resource when you run a conference, which is you. Because you alone are the one that can actually make the conference happen. Like, uh, not conference, but the uh, meetup and the community kind of stuff. It, that, I think, is the only, only single thing that you actually need to run a local community. You need the one person, and that one person needs to be you if you're interested in, interested in having a local Python community. Uh, of course, if you find other people, those will help. I tend to classify the other people like in uh, two buckets. The one bucket is the other organizers, and the other part is the like speakers, trainers, and so, stuff like that. So if you get other organizers on board, that's really great. Like if you actually meet someone else who's willing to help you with that, that, that is a superb thingy. And when you get other people on board, you should have only one aim. You should actually ma aim to make yourself uh, replaceable. Like, if you get other volunteers on board, like, start sharing responsibility. Don't, don't just hog on stuff because you were here first. Like, aim to the fact that at some point, like, they can do, they can run the whole conference, be like peers to you, not not like you create any weird power structures inside your community. A good uh, example of this is like the Pi Stockholm community where my friend Tume, who ran it for a long time, uh, actually won in the green card lottery and just left in New York. And he could just hand out the community to other people. And it kept on running on its own without him, even though he was kind of viewed as a, like a driving force behind that. But remember that when you have other people on board, they're, they're also volunteers. So you can't force them to do anything. Uh, the only thing I usually stress to people uh, and I try to keep in mind myself too, is that if you work on this kind of stuff and you feel that you lack the time or uh, it's too much or you want to drop out, like, fine, just do it. Like, 
<laughs> please don't break yourself by building like a voluntarily built uh, communities, but actually stop, stop, but please do tell the other people. So don't just disappear, but say to the other people that, hey, I feel like I'm running out of time. Uh, can someone take over my stuff? And usually people can. So remember that you're also one of the volunteers in this uh, thingy, and there's no point of breaking yourself in it. Then you get to the other parts, like speakers and trainers and stuff like that. If you want to run a meetup, you don't need any of these. You don't need anyone to talk about any topics. Just get people together, just regular people interested in the topic, whether it's Python, uh, whether it's other PyLadies, whether it's Django developers, or whether it's you and Hinek with the Twisted stuff, and that's it. All right, so that was the people part. Next part, what people usually think about, like how much do you need money to run this stuff? Uh, I didn't view money and time as a kind of a two currencies that you can like exchange one to the other. So you want to you uh, you want to spend less money, well, use more time and the other way around. So first, the time is the tricky one because you need to sp spend some time and you can spend as much time as you want running a local community. Uh, I can always tell the. Same words as everyone else, so like learn to prioritize, focus on what's important. Uh, and that is a damn hard thing. Like, all of a sudden you find out that you're tweaking the, your communities. You, you haven't done any meetups because you want to build the web page where you want to build the sign-up form with Django. And then you heard about, hear about this new database technology and you're like just cramming everything together. And then you want to maybe add that bootstrap on that and design stuff. Forget all that kind of stuff. Like, it, the easiest way is just to send out emails to the people. Maybe you can create a Google group. Uh, like, learn, you need to learn to sort of a time management that, like, you focus on a, uh, essential parts, which is pretty much you find a place where to get together, and then you try to reach out to those people somehow. We're going to talk about later how that works. Uh, the money is, is a thing that you don't need at all. If you look at this, it might kind of feel kind of weird that don't you need money running uh, stuff like uh, conferences, stuff like that? Well, sure. But if you're going to run a community event, the, you can just gather together somewhere. If it's a country like this, you can even go in a park, given that it's not raining. Uh, if it's a country like Finland, you can probably just find a pub or university place, or maybe your local library has some uh, space where you can just gather together or go to a cafe and just sit around the same table and, well, see who shows up. If you have some money to use, then that's really nice, because then you can use money to uh, reduce the time you spend. You can use money to, I don't know, buy a meetup.com account, and it, which kind of offloads your, some of your organizing stuff and such stuff. Uh, yeah. It, anyway, like money is the thing that helps you, but you don't really need it. So don't feel like you need to gather uh, like billion partners and sponsors to help you. The partners and sponsors are also interesting thingy because while they help, they are also not, need, uh, not needed. But if you happen to be in any city that has uh, uh, some tech scene in there already, uh, what I found out the best thing with like a kind of partners and sponsors for meetups is that you can ask them that hey, can we? host the meetup at your place. Usually the companies are pretty willing to do that. Like they have a meeting room or something where you can gather together. They might they probably have an overhead projector if you want to show some slides and stuff like that. Like if you or if people want to show stuff on their computers. Plus if you're 20, 20, 30 people or like if you're a small group, they probably even give you like beverages or food or stuff like that. But also this is kind of a bonus stuff that you don't need. All right, so we got to the point that you have a nice motivation of why you want to run a Python community. Uh, you figured out that you're going to do it all your own because you don't need anything else. And then you kind of end up with this question, like, if it's a new community, if there's nothing in there, like, how do you tell people about that? Of course, like, you have your friends and stuff like that, but how do you tell the people about that? You well, know, there are a few things I found useful when uh, I, that was especially when we bootstrapped the Finnish Python community. Like, go nuts with existing user groups, even if they're not like Python user groups. Just like, in a, in a, especially in a smaller countries or small, uh, like a smaller tech scenes or more 
connected text things. Like if you send the PHP user user group that, hey, we're going to have a Python conference, there's probably some poor soul who has to write PHP and is in the PHP user group just for that, but actually likes Python. Or you just go bold and like set, send to the Python unknown, announce that, hey, there's going to be the first Python user group of our city uh, gathering in this uh, one town. And that's a really nifty way of like reaching out to people that you don't necessarily even know, but who might be still be interested in the topic. Another quite handy one was internal mailing lists of uh, companies. So if you have some bigger companies like, uh, I'm blanking on uh, bigger major enterprises. Oh well, uh, let's say I'll throw some funny ones from Finland, Microsoft and Nokia. <laughs> uh, uh, if you have, if you know people who work in this. Bigger, bigger like mega corporations, or even like let's say companies of tens or hundreds of people, they usually have internal mailing lists. So you can ask those people like, "Hey, I'm doing this event. Can you promote this in your internal mailing list?" And if they, if those people who you know are kind of pro for this event, they're like or coming themselves, they're probably going to send some sort of announcement mail in the internal mailing list. And we found out that when we did this around Finland, we actually found a lot of people didn't follow like Python scene at all, but work with Python, and the only way they heard about it was that someone sent this email to the mailing list. And now they're regulars in, uh, in the meetups and also in the conferences in the Helsinki. And then, of course, there's the usual stuff like post public, post on Facebook, and uh, go nuts on the Twitter. And if you have some money, and if, you, if there's an existing tech scene that uses meetup.com, spending a few bucks per month to meetup.com is actually pretty neat. Because if there are other meetups, they will get notifications like, hey, there's a new meetup called the local Python meetup uh, at your neighborhood. If you don't have any other user groups using meetup.com, the value of the service is kind of questionable. All right. So we reached a point where, we, uh, where you've done your meetups, you have a nice community, local, tiny local community running, and then you feel like it's time to grow up. So first thing I would ask you to think about when you think about growing up to be a conference or maybe more recurring meetups and stuff like that, do you actually want to? Because that's going to imply a bit more work. Uh, that's going to imply some other stuff also. But like the, if you're really happy with the community as it is, if you, if you like, don't grow for the sake of growing. Because if you have a nice community that people actually like being a part of, why necessarily grow it? Maybe you can wait for another year, or maybe you can wait for half a year and see what, how you feel then. If you don't feel like growing, then don't try to force it to be a bigger uh, community. Now, if you and the other organizers feel that you want to grow it, then first thing you need that you, is the, the other people. Like, it would be kind of madness to think that this, not even this kind of, well, that's kind of, uh, let's say that you would like to run like a 100-person conference. Like, running that alone is probably possible, but you're going to just burn out and uh, feel really bad afterwards. So you actually need other people. And the other tip I've learned is that you want to organize. You want to uh, spin up a non-profit. If you're going to start handling more and more money, you want to spin up non-profit because that gives you not only is it usually easy in any country, uh, but that also gives you like a sort of legal structure and makes you actually track how the money flows and add some responsibility. But there's also a caveat in this because if you actually add like legal responsibility when people join join your nonprofit as board members, then that's going to stress them out. So there's a like sort of balance you have to have. And in the end, I want to stress this: that don't be afraid to reach out to inexperienced people. Reach out to us who have done all the mistakes down the, down the path on building a, taking a community and building it to a conference and ask from us like what kind of advice would we give you. All right. And in the end, like whether you grow it or not, whether you're running your community or not, just keep in mind that you keep doing it only as long as you feel like it. If at some point you feel that it's going to take too much time, then that's it. Uh, you can always step down. If it's a successful community, someone will uh, pick it up. And amazing quote from Django girl, girls that be proud of yourself if you're going to do this stuff because that's what matters the most. So go build your Python communities and thank you.
I think we have time for a pair of questions or three, so. Okay. Thanks for such a nice talk. I have a question. So even thinking positively, like being proud and so on, my question is about the negative side. If there is some, how healthy is it? For example, there are always people like trolls or people like aggressive recruiters or perhaps someone else. Do you have some experience or how do you either approach it or just ignore it or is the spirit being damaged or not? And if yes, how and so on, thanks. Uh, so let me just recap. Uh, so you asked me like if there's people who behave badly and that kind of stuff, like how you cope. Yeah. yeah. How to accommodate. Yeah. Uh, well, I've been lucky enough that I haven't like met anything too bad. But of course, like the stuff that conference organizers, handbooks, and those promote that if you if you're going to start setting up something, then you might con or you should consider setting up like a code of conduct or something, because that also gives you a nice basis of like if you get this weird behavior that you can re reference to these like commonly accepted rules and say like, hey, that's not okay. Then it's of course a hard question like if you have a really bad case, but h like how do you solve it? Like if like you can have like one person po like poisoning the whole community. Unfortunately, I don't have any ready-made answer to that, and I haven't. I've been lucky enough to uh, to not to be having to deal with stuff like that. I know I know that there are like individuals in the communities that are kind of iffy, but then like if the rest of the community works, then usually those people tend to keep their mouth shut and just sit and enjoy the show on the side. Uh, unfortunately, I can't give any more specific answer on that. You got but one more? But don't let it stop you. Like, just <laughs> deal when it becomes a problem. Don't be too afraid of it beforehand. Note question, just a remark. It's always good to organize yourself on an other conference. The Python user group Cologne was founded on the free open source conference in St. Augustine because we met always there and we know we are Python user and you should just consider to find people of your town here. It's a good idea to talk if you want to make your own small community. Yeah, that's a good advice. Thank you. Here there was an, another question. Th thanks for the great talk. Uh, I just wanted to mention that, if I'm not mistaken, the Python Software Foundation pays for the meetup.com uh, registration. Ah, oh, yes. I actually had it in my speaker notes, but I apparently blasted through it. But thank you. So, yes. Python Software Foundation will reimburse you at meetup.com. Yeah, for Python meetup, not like everything. <laughs> We've got place for one more question. Thanks for the talk. Um, do you have an experience how to reach uh, to people who have children? So how to make it more possible to them to get involved? Uh, we done, in Stockholm we done, uh, uh, or my employee at Spotify has done like a few things where we actually hosted like this kid, like a kid coding sessions or like how to teach kids coding. So I think that's, I think that's one good thing, like if you wanna, if you also want to involve the kids. If you have a smaller kids, mm. uh, I think we have had a few meetups where we have had like actual small kids uh, involved. Uh, it's a hard question because, uh, well, people might react to the, like what I find pretty stupid is that people react to the bringing kids sometimes like in a weird ways, uh, while they usually don't cause any harm. And then people are gonna be and I'm, I'm talking more about like the, the Nordic culture, like they expect meetups to have beer and stuff like that. So we've also tried sometimes to have meetups completely without alcohol, like cut down these kind of barriers that make it kind of iffy to bring your kids in there. Uh, we haven't had any great effect on that though, so we haven't seen anything. Um, but I don't know, uh, if the kids are big enough to like take part themselves, then try that. If, if there's smaller ones, then I would say they maybe you could have a uh, like a 
Python parents meetup or something. Like you can drill down and you can try to make the event to be like as much as people in the same like a state of life as the others, and maybe make it a bit more welcoming and that so that people actually feel that they are welcome with their kids. Because it might be really hard if you have a common meetup with like 120 year old white males in there, and then the one parent. Okay, we've run out of time. Thank you, Yerki, for our <laughs> questions and answers. Thank you.